Okay, as folks are joining in, um, we'll just be a few minutes. We have about 85 people who have RSVP'd for this particular um, training session, seminar session. Uh, just ask that if you haven't done so, please just mute yourself. And we do encourage you to keep your cameras on, and at least for our participants, because it's so much nicer to talk to faces as opposed to dark screens. <laughs> but we'll get started in just a couple minutes. Thank you, Raylan. Okay, we'll go, we have a good number of folks with us, so we'll get started. Hi, everyone. My name is Dime. I'm an assistant director at the Quattro Center for the Fair Administration of Justice at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Um, as I think everybody on this call knows, we host these monthly meetings for people who are engaged in post-conviction litigation and investigation, both for prosecutors and defense counsel, to provide some training and common dialogue on the issues that you all face and the work that you do. We are able to do this through a grant that the Quattrone Center has through the Bureau of Justice Administration uh, as part of the Upholding the Rule of Law grant. 
um, as we provide technical training and assistance to CIUs and innocence organizations all around the country that are trying to work together in this pretty challenging workspace. So I, um, we are being recorded. People should know that and we'll be able to access the recording on our YouTube site as well as on a website, convictionreview.net, which we have set up for specifically for units which are uh, either setting up or revamping their policies and procedures where there's a wealth of information on that site. And I encourage people to visit it if you have not. Um, so one thing I wanna do is just kind of highlight for next month, the next two months, July and August, um, we're gonna be continuing the trend of uh, people who are actually doing the work, doing pre presenting the training. So we're going to be hearing from prosecutors across the country who have dealt with the situation of investigating a post-conviction claim of innocence while also pursuing a live suspect investigation and all of the very difficult ethical um, quandaries that that poses, as well as very frankly, uh, logistical issues that can arise. So we're gonna be hearing from prosecutors who have done that and who have thought through some of these issues kind of share what that's like for everybody who's who's doing this for when you encounter that situation. So that'll be for July and for August. So I want to um, want up front thank um, Matt Howard and Rose Bell who are joining us today from Texas. Um, Rose and Matt worked together for the exoneration of Rose's client um, in which culminate, I believe, in December of 2020, if I'm not mistaken. Um, this case in particular presents a lot of different challenges, particularly for CIUs, um, Matt and I have spoken about this case and I'm very anxious for him to tell you about it as well. But he says that it really challenged the way as a CIU they were approaching cases, um, gave him some issues that they hadn't really thought about before and has caused him to, to rethink how as a director he is really running his unit and some of the policies and procedures that they involve. Rose is a very experienced trial attorney. She was a prosecutor before becoming a defense attorney. Um, and it was the collaborative effort of the two working together that was really able to result in such a great outcome for, um, for justice and for the client as well. So I'm just very, very happy that you can be here with us. I'm gonna kind of sit back and let Rose and Matt carry this, but if you have questions or you wanna comment on something, please use the chat to do that. Um, we've got over 50 folks who are on the call, so asking people to unmute would be a little unwieldy, but please use the chat and I'll be happy to kind of pass that along um, or uh, Matt or Rose, if you see that, take it on your own. So thank you both so much for being with us. I'm very much looking forward to hearing about this case you worked on. So I'm going to turn it over to Matt and Rose. Okay, well, um, thank you very much, Marissa, and um, thank you to the Quatron Center for, for having us. You know, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about these things and to, um, can I have that common dialogue that, that you spoke about a moment ago, Marissa? I think that's really important when it comes to post-conviction um, and it comes to the um, kind of work we're all doing across across the country. Um, just to say a couple of things real quick, um, kind of before getting into um, Mr. Timayev's case. Um, so I've been with the uh, Bear County Conviction Integrity Unit since we were created in 2015. Um, during that time, we've had the opportunity to work on a number of cases, but um, you know, every every single one or every single situation, it kind of comes down to like. We thought we knew what we were doing. We found out we didn't know what we were doing and we had a lot to learn. Um, and, and we kind of keep evolving as we move through. And the way that um, Marissa had described it the other week was um, it's kind of like having to build the plane while you're flying the plane. Um, it's, you know, you kind of have to adapt and pivot and learn as you move through. So um, for our purposes today, I wanted to talk about uh, where we were before Mr. Temayev's case came in. And then, um, how Mr. Temeyev's case, you know, the, the unique issues that it presented and, you know, kind of how we adapted to that and what we had to work through with, with Rose and then where we're going, where, where we, um, you know, what the changes that we made and the policies that we, we put in place. But um, before I get into any of that stuff and any of the um, policy that was in our office as we received Mr. Temeyev's case, I wanted to um, give Rose the opportunity to introduce herself and talk a little bit about Mr. Temeyev coming to her. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Ms. Bluestein stated earlier, my name is Rosabelle. I was a prosecutor in Bear County, Texas for about 22 years. I retired from the office in 20, at the end of 2018 and started doing defense work at the beginning of 2019. 
I was actually in the administration of the DA's office when the Conviction Integrity Unit was created in 2015. Um, I was a chief of one of the divisions under the DA who created the CIU here in Bear County. Um, but my involvement was just being on the team at the time and I had really no contact much myself with the CIU once it was created in our office. Um, the case on Mr. Timofeyev came to me, I'm gonna call him Mishka. Um, that's what he goes by and it's much easier to pronounce. Um, he came to me in early 2020, he was referred let me start this way. Mishka was, he's been a resident of the US since 1997. He originally was in the performing arts of Russia and when he came over to the United States, um, he decided he wanted to live here and he applied for residency and he's been a resident since 1997. He decided he wanted to apply for naturalization in I believe around 2018 and he hired an immigration attorney to try and help him with that. And when he was going through the naturalization process, his attorney at the time told him that this uh, case he had from 09, this assault bodily injury married case that he had from 09 was gonna be a big problem for his naturalization, which he did not know. Um, she then referred him to a criminal attorney who just happened, who was a friend of hers, who happened to actually be the elected judge of the court he had pled in back in 09. So that attorney told him she couldn't handle the case. She was conflicted out and she referred him to a number of attorneys. I was one of the people on the list that she referred him to. He contacted me in early 2020 to ask about a potential writ. Um, I talked to him a little bit about it and then I didn't hear from him for a number of months. Um, I think he kind of shopped around because another, a few other attorneys I know told me that they had spoken to Mishka as well. He came back to me in early summer of 2020 and decided that he wanted to pursue a, a writ case. So at that point, I decided to try and get as much information I could from both him and about the underlying case. He had explained to me that when he took the plea that he was not given any admonishments by his attorney concerning how this would affect his naturalization. Um, he said he vaguely remembered there was a mention about deportation, but there was nothing about him applying for naturalization at a later time. So I went and tracked down the underlying case. Um, I went to the court. My friend, who was the elected judge at the time, actually did not take his plea. They have a very heavy docket in that family violence court, and so sometimes they would have associate judges come in and take pleas. Uh, Mishka's plea was taken by an associate judge. So I had to track down um, the court reporter who filled in on that day to take that plea. And I tracked it down to finally two different court reporters. I went to both of them. Um, and of course I selected the wrong one first and finally the second one was able to find the actual transcript of what happened. And when she pulled the transcript and sent it to me, the only discussion concerning his immigration issues, they asked if he was a citizen, he said no. The only comment the judge made when she talked to him about any potential immigration problems was, and I wrote it down to make sure I got it correct. Her quote was, and you understand that this can trigger deportation proceedings. That was the only thing that appeared on the transcript, nothing else. Um, so I had the court reporter send me a copy of the transcript. I had that so that I would have it to send to the Conviction Integrity Unit when I decided to file the writ. I also got some documentation from my clients about his original residency status. He had his original birth certificate from Russia that had been translated by a certified uh, translation company. Um, I had his marriage license, which in this case, he wound up marrying the victim of his assault case. And one of the issues that comes up or I presented to Matt when I presented the writ was, my client is married to a man, which in Russia is problematic. And so if, this was gonna be a huge problem if he wound up having to be deported back to Russia based on their stance on how they look at, um, at his marriage. So that was one of the things that Matt and I talked about and we, I included in, in the writ discussion. But I gathered up all these items. I also had a letter from the victim who is now the spouse of my client. Um, his husband's name is Manny. Manny had written the judge and sent a letter into the court back in 09 at the time of the offense and prior to the plea, trying to waive uh, pursuing charges. He wanted not to prosecute the case. He said it, this was not 
something that happened. Um, they got it all wrong. And he sent that to the judge. Of course, he got no response. It was just in the court's file. But Manny had retained a copy of that and he forwarded that to me before I filed the writ. Manny also sent me a letter describing what happened on that day um, and gave it in great detail and gave detail about the actual day of the plea that he had been in the district attorney's office talking to someone in the DA's office while Mishka was down in court. And when he told them in the DA's office he did not want to pursue charges and that it did not occur the way the report read, the person from the DA's office called down to court and they were told that Mishka had just finished his plea. So the plea had already taken place even though Manny had been upstairs in the office trying to have them not pursue the charges. Um, Mishka and Manny both told me that he had never been told that this would have any repercussions concerning him applying for citizenship. So I had all these documents um, because I had been in the office and I knew Matt and Matt and I didn't work together, but I knew Matt. Um, I contacted him and I let him know that I was going to be filing a, a writ of habeas corpus for my client to try and overturn this conviction. And I let him know all the documents I had and I attached them actually to the email. I attached Manny's letter. Um, I believe the letter that had been written to the judge. I also uh, attached a copy of the transcript so that Matt could read it himself to see that the admonishments were not sufficient. Um, and I think I attached his residency card. That was the first email that I sent to Matt. And I double checked all my dates before I came online today just to see. I sent all those documents to Matt on July 21st of last year. And when I looked through my emails, we must have emailed each other at least five or six times, I think, that day um, in discussions about Matt let me know what the procedure was for CIU, how they would review the case, the two different tracks that they had, um, and, and just that he received my documents and where we would go from there. And so on July 21st, we had been emailing back and forth. On July um, 27th, Matt emailed me and asked if there were any people who'd be willing to write letters concerning seeing the relationship between Mishka and Manny over the years. Because at this point, when I'm writing Matt in 2020, Mishka and Manny had actually been together since 02 and had been married since 2016. So they'd been together for a long time. So Matt asked if there were any character references that could be referred to him concerning their relationship and seeing them currently and even if they knew them back then. I let Mishka and Manny know. They responded quickly. They had friends email me quickly. I was able to get two character letters to Matt within a day. So on the 28th, I forwarded those two character letters that Matt had requested. Um, he and I emailed back and forth again. He also asked if he could speak to Manny about the letter that had been written to the judge and also the letter that had been written to me so that he could discuss what happened on the day of the alleged offense with Matt and, and he could clarify some things. I talked to Manny about that. I told him it would, it would be in their best interest for him to cooperate with Matt to be forthcoming um, that I trusted that anything he told them would, would work out. And so Manny did, he spoke to Matt. Um, I got an email from Matt on July 31st that he had spoken to the people who had written the two character letters. He had also spoken to Manny. And so at that point, Matt let me know that he had all the information he needed at that point and he was gonna take it up to his administration and let them kind of give him the go ahead on how to proceed from there. And then I just kind of waited until Matt had the discussions with his administration. And then a couple of weeks later, I got noticed that the administration was going to be allowing him to proceed on the equitable relief track. And I'll let Matt go into all those tracks because he can talk about all this, the distinctions. Um, but that discussion was had in mid-August. And by the end of August, I had drafted and filed my petition um, to the court it was sent to a judge who also had previously been a prosecutor um, in the administration I had been in and also knew Matt. The judge got the petition. He asked a couple of questions. He sent us both an email requesting that there be a signature line for the DA's office that it was approved and agreed to. Um, I tweaked what he wanted, sent it back to Matt and um, we filed it within a couple of days. So by August 31st, we had a signed order from the judge granting relief to my client, which this is my first writ case. And I'm being told that that's pretty quick and that this, all the stars aligned for me in this case and that it all worked out well. Um, so that's the story for Mishka. And, and 
It got signed and filed. Matt filed a dismissal. It was outside of the statute of limitations once the dismissal was filed, so the case was taken care of at that point. Your turn, Matt. Okay. Actually, but Matt, if you don't mind, before uh, you do, Rose, when you filed that writ, was it based on the ineffectiveness of counsel of the failure, or was it based on actual innocence based um, because of what Manny was saying? Or I both? Think we we did it, Matt and I discussed, I'll let Matt actually into it because we discussed and we went back and forth on how um, we did the terminology and we made it bare bones because I was told by some immigration attorney friends that the way the order read could affect how it affected their immigration um, proceedings. And so Matt and I discussed the order um, before we sent it into the judge. And I don't have the order in front of me. Matt, do you recall? I so um, to... I guess, I don't know if this is a great answer to the question. Um, Rose is correct. We did uh, everything at that point in time, everything about the final order was drafted around the immigration consequences in this case. So I made it very clear in everything that I signed that the state could not prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt, um, that if we were uh, asked to proceed forward to trial, we would not be able to do so. Um, it was very clear and should the, the idea, the objective was that it would be very clear to any immigration judge or any authority later on looking at the, that documentation that he was actually innocent and that we could not proceed forward on the case. Um, so, uh, you know, that's that was kind of the, at the end result of the process. I think the initial writ that was filed dealt with the ineffectiveness of counsel and the um, immigration issues in the case, but by the time that we end the um, the process, we ended up on, you know, we cannot prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt. He's actually innocent of, of this offense. So um, that, that kind of speaks to the development of the case and having to pivot as we moved uh, along there. Um, Marissa, does that answer your, your question? Yep. Well enough, you think? Thank okay. you. <laughs> well, um, okay, so to, to jump in and give the other half of the story here. Um, so where we started um, or where we were before um, the receipt of the application and during the receipt of the application and the initial contact here, um, we had a couple different tracks for relief when it comes to cases like this one. And based on everything that you all have heard just a moment ago, immigration is the thing that, that hops out. So um, we have an immigration track. We also have an equitable relief track. Um, and when I talk about tracks, just policies that apply to certain cases and ways that we're going to review cases. Um, immigration and equitable relief for us, the policies on those are um, somewhat similar. We look to see, uh, does this person have uh, any other criminal history? Does this person have good ties to the community? Are there, you know, character references, that type of thing? There are just things that we would prepare, our Conviction Integrity Unit would prepare to take up to our administration in a uh, presentation for why relief should be agreed to in this case, you know, why this is a good candidate for us to sign on with. So uh, at the time when Rose first contacted me, those are the options that I'm talking to her about. I, I, was, I was saying, well, we have this pre-existing uh, track for immigration and this pre-existing track for um, equitable relief. So we start talking about what the requirements would be for that uh, and what our policy at that point in time dictated. Um, the kind of wrench in the system for us is that those policies at that point in time, um, if someone had a domestic violence case, that was a very big red flag. That was a, a you know almost an automatic disqualifier for us. Not, not a complete disqualifier, but um, that really would make us slow down the process and say, okay, we, we probably can't agree under these circumstances. So um, that being said, this case, you know, we were, we were thinking, can we make an exception here? Is there something we can do? We knew that Manny, uh, Mishka's husband, was, was already on board, um, but we, we wanted to know, could we have enough for our office? And what could we have enough if we take this to the court to, to get relief granted? Um, so we just thought about the different things that we might need. And Rose was great about the back and forth with me and about providing everything that we needed along the way. Um, so we, we started from a place of, we had these pre-existing policies, but there were things that it didn't, you know, we, we knew that we needed to revise how we dealt with domestic violence issues and how we talked about those issues. And so all of that kind of is an outgrowth of this case. But um, as we're working on it, I asked Rose if 
if I could speak to Manny. And um, like she said a moment ago, she was nice enough to get us connected with each other. Um, well, so when we, um, when we actually make contact with Manny, uh, that's when everything kind of shifted for us in this case. And we realized, wait a second, this is not going to be an equitable relief situation or a, a situation where we're having to, um, you know, kind of help someone out of an immigration place. This is someone who has been wrongfully convicted of, of an offense. This is someone who is actually innocent. And Manny was very clear about that from, from day one. So um, kind of moving from where we were before, there's the investigation of this case and the things that we, we learned on this case. So um, part of this is going to be me giving you an idea of the specific facts of this and kind of the red flags that we saw along the way. And Rose, if I say anything here that you want to jump in on, or if there's like a, a you know, comment that needs to be made on it, please let me know. But this is just from our end of things. Here's what we're seeing. And then here's kind of how Manny's, um, Man Manny's part of the truth of it comes in for us. So um, basically early, 20, to early 2006, um, Manny called the police and he reported that Mishka had, had struck him, had punched him. Um, very straightforward, domestic violence. Um, police go out and they respond to that call. Um, Manny told police on the call that Mishka wanted money for drugs. He refused to give Mishka money for the drugs. Um, and so that's why Mishka had struck him. Um, however, police didn't know this at the time. And, um, you know, maybe they could have figured it out if they would have paid attention to the scene there. Um, Manny told me that he was struggling with, with problems with alcohol at that point in time in his life. Um, he was drunk during the initial report to police. Um, alcohol was a major problem for him. Um, he's since gone through a 12-step program and he's, he's gotten a lot better, but at that point in time, alcohol was a big problem for him. So uh, at the point in time when he called, he had been inebriated or he had been intoxicated. Um, basically, they had a fight over um, his use of alcohol and his drinking. Um, he, as part of that fight, threatened Mishka and said, if you don't let me have a drink, if you don't let me have access to the alcohol here in our bar, I'm going to call the police. And, you know, he knew that sort of, um, he knew the weight of a threat like that. And he knew exactly, you know, what that would do. Um, despite that, they, um, it, Mishka did not let him have any alcohol. Things got, got heated. Eventually, Manny makes a call to police and reports, reports the offense. Well, um, by the time that police get there, Manny has sobered up a little bit and he's immediately telling them this, this didn't happen. I, 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 you know, he did not, uh, he didn't strike me. Um, police, these police officers are used to domestic violence calls. That's something they hear quite a bit. Um, they go ahead and place Mishka under arrest. Um, Let me jump in right there, just sure. so you all know. In Bear County, the requirement, um, if there's a call for family violence, then the position of the San Antonio Police Department is somebody has to be taken down. Somebody has to be removed from the house. And so even if somebody on the scene says it didn't happen or I don't want to press charges, the position of the San Antonio Police Department is somebody has to be removed from the house and taken, taken down to the jail. Sorry, man. Well, no, no, and thank you for, for adding that in there because um, basically regardless of the, the red flags at the scene, um, police go ahead and make the arrest because they, they have to because of policy. Um, so just a couple of things to note about the arrest and about the police report. And these things become very important to us later on when we start looking at this case and we start considering um, what Manny is telling us. You know, Manny says that it never happened. He's consistently recanted throughout. So we went and looked at the police report for things that were consistent with that recantation. So um, the police report's about a half page long, handwritten. Um, the police note that there's no visible injury on Manny. Um, there is a complete recantation of, of the um, allegation against Mishka. Uh, they note that it was at a bar uh, where all this took place. It's a bar that Mishka and Manny um, co-own with each other. So there's access to alcohol there. Um, no photos were ever taken of the injury. Um, no, 
victim statement uh, written or otherwise is taken from Manny. Um, and they note in the report that no, there were no witnesses to the assault. No one at the bar saw the assault happen. Um, no one was able to provide a supplemental statement to police. Basically, it was a very bare bones report. Um, so after he's arrested, um, Mishka is taken into custody. Um, he bonds out, but he goes back into custody again shortly after he's arraigned. Uh, and then he's in custody up through the time of his plea. Um, the case is filed in County Court 7 here. Um, during the time between Mishka's arrest and the time of his plea, as Rose said just a moment ago, uh, Manny is attempting to get in touch with uh, anybody who will listen to him and say that he, you know, that, that this didn't happen um, the way that the police think that, that uh, Mishka did not punch him. So uh, from our side of things, we can see, I can see now that he was attempting to reach out to our office, but exactly as Rose said, he was not able to make contact with the prosecutors. He makes contact with an investigator and he's actually giving that statement or giving a, a recantation to the investigator while Mishka is taking his plea. Um, so it, it's just, it's really unfortunate. It's terrible that all of that's happening at the same time. And that Mishka, who has been brought, no, brought over from jail, he wants to be released. He takes a plea at the same time that Manny is a couple floors away in our office speaking with an investigator. Um, obviously, there's a lot to say about that situation, but it's just a failure of communication between um, different sides there. Clearly, um, there's some root cause analysis and error correction to be done there, and I'll talk more about that here in just a little bit. Um, but the, the short version is Mishka goes ahead and takes a plea. Uh, he gets placed on deferred adjudication uh, for a period of one year, but um, he misses a couple of check-ins and then he misses some fines and then two year, or one year becomes two years. Um, then eventually he's brought in for those violations and he's in and out of jail during that time. And eventually he's revoked and he's sentenced to 54 days in jail. Um, so end result there, Despite the deferred adjudication, he ends up with, with a conviction for domestic violence. Um, at the time of his plea, he knows that he faces immigration issues. I, I don't know if his attorney um, gave him affirmative misadvice when it came to the um, immigration consequences of, of that sort of plea or what, but one way or another, he did ultimately take a plea to that. Um, and another thing to talk about here in a little bit is why, why do innocent people take pleas to cases. Um, but I mean, it's kind of clear from a situation like this, there's a lot of pressure associated with it. I mean, he's brought over directly from the jail to take a plea in this case. He's got a business to run. I mean, there's, there's a lot of considerations for him. Um, so about 10 years after his conviction, um, that's when he reaches out to Rose and that's when Rose makes contact with us. And we start, um, you know, kind of start the process of working on this case. Um, Immediately, it's apparent to us all the different ways that, that Manny has tried to recant, uh, all the different pieces of information that he's brought to the court, that he's brought to uh, our office previously, and everything that he has given to, to Rose. And so we've got the recantation, but then, um, you know, the obstacles that the case presents, you know, it, um, we were dealing with kind of the lack of evidence. And how do you prove a negative? How do you prove that this, this didn't happen? How do you find some sort of cooperation with um, the recantation in the case. And so we kind of struggled with how do we, um, what is enough to corroborate Manny's statement that this didn't happen? Is it enough that um, the police report is so bare bones? Is it enough that there's no images um, ever taken of injury? Is it enough that there's no injury reported? Um, is it enough that there are no witnesses to the assault um, or to the alleged assault? So we kind of struggled with how do we, um, how do we prove that negative and what's going to be enough for the court? Um, fortunately for us, we had had a, uh, an exoneration a few months previously uh, here in Texas, and it had actually gone up to the uh, Court of Criminal Appeals, so our highest criminal court. And we were able to look at that for kind of a good guideline on what would be sufficient cooperation for a recantation in a case like this one, where you have the complete lack of evidence. Um, and in that case, it was sufficient that we had... Uh, an affidavit from a doctor basically saying that he could verify no injury. So 
With that in mind, we looked at all of the different indications here that there was never any sort of injury. We took those indications along with the recantation from Manny and consistent recantations, um, consistent credible recantations over a period of a decade. Um, we presented all that to the judge and we were able to get a good result. Um, and we were very fortunate that the judge was willing to work with us. We were very fortunate that um, Rose was so absolutely willing every step of the way. If, if I ask her for something, she could usually have it to me within an hour. Uh, it was just amazing that we were able to cooperate so well throughout this process to get to a good result for um, a good result for Mishka and a good result for Manny um, and, and able to, to get this taken care of. Um, so that's kind of leading up through the case and the different things that it make, made us consider. Um, and there's a question here in the chat. Okay, um, what case from the CC are you referencing um, re-corroboration? So um, in Bear County, we had had um, ex parte John Palmer. And the reason why it's important for us is it's, it's out of Bear County. Um, it was a sexual assault of a child case where the child was, was now recanting. Um, Basically, the, the allegations from the time of the assault or the alleged, uh, alleged sexual assault was 30 years ago. The allegations were kind of, um, I mean, they were, they were very violent, very grotesque. Um, we had the recantation from the, um, from the complainant, but we didn't have anything else. And it was very similar to this case. The police report was very bare bones. There was not um, any sort of examination done or anything like that. Um, that, that we could point to. I mean, there was basically just the, the allegation within the police report. Um, so in that case, a doctor examined the complainant today and said, well, if these things took place 30 years ago, the complainant would have long lasting damage. Um, there would be these indications that this took place and there was nothing like that. There was no sign of injury. Um, so that's ex parte Palmer. Um, it's from last summer and it was not, um, wasn't published, but it was enough. I mean, it was a Bear County case and that was enough for us to kind of say, okay, this is what the Court of Criminal Appeals would be looking for when it comes to actual innocence and recantations. And what would enough corroborating evidence for a recantation be when you're thinking about um, kind of the lack of evidence or, you know, a case that's so old that we can't go back and dig through and, and look for more information on Hopefully that answers that question. I know it's it's not um, the best or most applicable answer, but it worked for us personally here just because we had had that experience several months prior to Mr. Tim Ayet's case. Um, okay, so all of that in mind, um, that's kind of how we got to the end of that case, but we got, um, there were some important things like takeaways for us and ways that we adjusted our policy and ways that we started thinking about uh, reviewing these cases and looking a little bit deeper afterwards and then some root cause analysis that we did and, and conversations we have with our line prosecutors but before I get into any of that um, Rose do you have anything you'd like to, to add to that narrative or to like kind of fill out your side of things there no I think that's pretty accurate I think that um, as Matt stated and I stated Manny did everything he could there was a letter from 09 there was a letter from last year last summer that he wrote to me. There was the, um, what he told Matt when he was interviewed. And so that was the most consistent thing, I think, in this case, which I think helped your unit in particular to make the decision. If I could interject with, with a question here, Matt, I just wanted to follow up, and this is really, I guess, for Rose. Um, you said several times that Rose was very forthcoming with you, that she was, would get you information. I guess, Rose, um, you know, why were you so willing to cooperate with them did you uh, did you have those discussions with your client did you you know, have like inform him of exactly what was going on and you know it sounds like it was really the trust that you had for each other that really made this work um and i'm guessing partly wondering you know why why you think that is here like why why did you trust matt in the office so much and do you think you would have had the same result with an office that you weren't so familiar with um, so part of the reasoning for being so forthcoming with Matt was while I was a prosecutor um, in all my years as being a prosecutor, I found that if, if I had good communication with a defense attorney, then often that was the best result for everybody. That it was the best result 
um, for the state, it was the best result for the defense, and often sharing that information gets the best result. I mean, as we all know, the state has their version, the defense has their version, the truth probably lies somewhere in between, right? We're never going to know everything. But I think oftentimes sharing that information will help. Um, I had a lot of discussions with Mishka and with Manny um, about whether or not they should talk to Matt, what information we should give. I... I felt comfortable with Matt. I felt that he would take that information and make the best decision. I didn't, and it's probably also because I was in that same office. So would I have felt that comfortable with an office I didn't know as well? Probably not, but I would have asked around to see because I tend to think, I know as defense attorneys generally, we wanna keep a lot of information to ourselves, which sometimes for trial is the best strategy. But you have to look at your entire case and figure out what is going to work best for your client. In this particular case, it was clear because I had evidence from all these years that Manny had tried to talk to everybody to explain that what the account was in the SAPD report was not what actually happened. Um, I think we, all, we also have had clients, all of us have had clients where maybe they don't present as the best witnesses. So you have to talk to them a lot to figure out how they are going to present to the DA's office and whether or not that's gonna be problematic or helpful. Um, in this particular case, it, it was a no brainer for me. As long as Manny was okay with it, after I talked to him, then I wanted him to talk to Matt and he was more than okay with it. And I explained that to Mishka as well. Um, I think, can I say it's a blanket statement that you should always give over everything? I would say no. I think everybody has to evaluate their case and determine exactly what you think you should turn over. But I think in some cases, turning over all your cards actually can be beneficial. And in this case, that's what I decided to do. Um, and I trusted that Matt and his office um, would do what they felt was the best thing in this particular case. And they did. I think it was to Mishka's benefit. But I think everybody has to evaluate exactly what the information is. But I tend to think that usually cooperation will get you a better result for everyone. I don't know how Matt feels about that, but that's my personal take on it. Great. Well, and um, I completely agree. <laughs> we, we um, so our unit, our, our office really, but this unit is all about um, openness and non-adversarial process. And we have tried to um, kind of put a voice to that. We've got policies now that are in place that are meant to really um, kind, of, kind of project that out there into the community. Look, we exist as a place of like, um, we are open to different claims. We're open to working with, with uh, habeas counsel and with defense groups to get to the right results. Um, we have a very robust discovery policy, which is basically we will give you everything under the sun, including work product. Um, we try to uh, foster this sort of trust and cooperativeness every step of the way. And this idea that we're not going to um, you know, uh, hamstring somebody or uh, otherwise, you know, sabotage their case if they've got a good claim and, and we're willing to work with people kind of every step of the way. So uh, we were very fortunate here that uh, Rose was able to put her trust in us and we were able to work with her. And we have, we've, we've had really great experiences with many different defense groups out there and many different attorneys that come to us and, and you know, kind of enjoy that non-adversarial side of things. But really, um, at this point in time in the proceeding, you know, post-conviction, habeas world, I mean, that's kind of what it should be. It should be that search for the truth and trying to work together to get to the right place. Um, so, I mean, that's that's our approach to it. Um, I'm getting a little bit of ahead of, ahead of myself here, but at the time when we worked with Rose, all of that was, hey, I hope that people in the community understand that they can do this since working with Rose and since working on Mr. Tameyev's case, it is, we need to really get out there to the community um, and to the county and to, to everyone under the sun. We're, we're open, we wanna work with you. We want this to be a non-adversarial proceeding and we wanna be able to foster that sort of trust and cooperativeness at this point. I don't know. Does that, I, I think we, we ended up way off track there, but Marissa, does that answer your question? <laughs> yes, it does. I apologize. Did not mean to, to get you. No, no, that's good. Um, 
Well, so just to kind of piggyback on that, just things that we learned from this case or things to talk about with this case, because we've, um, the fact that this is a domestic violence case, it has kind of given our office some amount of pause um, when it comes to like, what, what, are, what are our lessons that we learned here? What do we take away from this to prevent this type of thing from happening on the front end? And it's kind of um, frustrating because for prosecutors, the things that we are telling them to do are things that many of them have already been doing. Um, so when we think about like what, what caused this problem, I mean, the biggest breakdown that I think jumps out is the failure to contact Manny. The fact that the prosecutors before the time of Misha's plea did not make contact with Manny. Um, I cannot find anywhere in our logs from 10 or 11 years ago or 12 years ago now um, why that contact wasn't made. I can't find any sort of indication for um, even an attempt to do so. Um, I can find logs that indicate um, Manny speaking with the investigator and giving a written statement recanting to the investigator on the day of the plea. Um, but why was that not communicated? None of that information ever ended up in the state's file. And so presumably it was never disclosed. Um, and, you know, nowadays, if something like that were to happen, even after the time of the plea, we would do a post-conviction disclosure and make sure that it's put out there. So, um, you know, talking to prosecutors, we've talked about like, how can we prevent this on the front end? And so much of it is almost like, it, 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 we don't want to tell people, you know, please just do your job. But part of the job is contacting witnesses before proceeding forward and making sure that your evidence is sufficient. Um, another part of that conversation is a um, very critical look at police reports, which I think a lot of our people are already doing. But when you have a situation like this, where you have a half handwritten page, um, you know, you might take a look at that and say, okay, I want more, or I need more from the arresting agency before we move forward to charging, or before we move forward to um, pleading a case or taking it to trial. Um, you know, inside of that, there are red flags that I think, depending on level of experience, different prosecutors might look for. Um, you know, immediately, if there's a recantation that's already like baked into the police report, that's something. Uh, if there are issues with the police report, such as, you know, there's no evidence of the injury or no evidence of the assault, there's no witnesses to the assault. Those are things that might give us a little bit of pause. Um, I can't account for why this case pled when it pled um, from, from the state side of things. But anyway, all of those things are things that we're telling our, our prosecutors now on the domestic violence side. Um, we know you're all already doing this. Please continue to do this, but just be aware that we've had exonerations come from people who have not done this correctly and who have not made um, contact with the victim or haven't done their, their um, investigation when it comes to their cases moving forward. And it's, it's tough because these courts have um, 30 to 50 cases on some of their docket days. I mean, they have quite a bit to work through. And so that's a big, um, a big ask for all of those, those prosecutors. But the other side of that is they have much more staff today than they did in 2009, 2010 when this case took place. So now they have uh, victim advocates assigned to those courts. Now they have additional staff to help them out. They have, indi um, they have individual investigators that can help them look at these. So it's our hope that that increase in resources will really uh, allow them to take a closer look at these cases to prevent these sort of wrongful convictions. Um, we've had a couple of questions from our ADAs that I think are Kind of important to mention here and i think every single person in this chat or every single person watching this could probably um speak to this issue but a big question that we get from adas is why do people who are innocent take pleas to cases why does somebody why would somebody take a plea if they know they didn't do it um and it's it's kind of an easy question to ask but it has a complicated answer i mean it's different for everybody but i mean there's going to be different pressures on individuals who are in, um, you know, who are facing charges and in that situation. And Rose can definitely speak to this better than I can being on the defense side now. But um, for, with, with, with our, from our side of things, I mean, it's easy to imagine Mishka's in custody. I mean, this is a way to get out of jail that day. And he's being told you get deferred adjudication. Whether his attorney told him that the federal government does not recognize deferred adjudication um, for the purposes of immigration, I don't know, 
But I mean, it was an easy way out of custody that day into a situation that sounded better than a straight conviction. Um, so there's pressure there. The other thing to consider is the fact that Mishka and Manny, they own a business together. Mishka is more than half of that business, debatably. He, um, they, they own a bar and restaurant and he was doing all the cooking. He was doing all the ordering of the food. He was um, basically the, the face of that place. And to have him disappear from the business for a while, that's, that's a big hit. Um, so, I mean, there's pressure there to get out. And so even though we might look at it and think, why would somebody take a plea to a case like this one? I mean, that may just be the pragmatic thing to do in, in, in his estimation or in anyone's estimation to get out of, of uh, jail quickly. Um, Rose, am I, am I missing anything there? Or am I, and I know that you have much more of a perspective on that now being out in private practice. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that's, there are lots of reasons people take a plea. I think, yeah, getting out of custody is probably the main reason people take a plea, even if they don't commit the offense. Um, deferred is always another big thing. I mean, everyone everyone here as a defense attorney knows that your clients, they're weighing, they're weighing what could happen, right? And there's always this discussion of, well, if you go to trial, you could have an actual conviction. Um, so people weigh their options to decide what they want to do. Um, one of the things I did want to mention, I know when we talked last week, when there was a discussion about how you can prevent this and you were talking about it, um, one of the main issues I saw, and we've discussed this previously, is that these offenses, while they are family violence, they're domestic violence cases, they're taken very seriously, but these are the brand new attorneys that are handling these cases, right? And so maybe one of the issues is that they're not asking the right questions or they're hearing a recantation, but they're already saying, well, I, I hear what you're saying, but you're just saying that because that's your boyfriend or your husband, or you just want him home. You're just saying that to get him out of custody. And so prosecutors are not necessarily going to listen to the recantations. So there's a lot of built-in problems with this type of offense itself um, that continue even, and, and I applaud the DA's office for making these changes to CIU, but these are continuing issues because on a domestic violence case, this is the one where if you dismiss it, right, and something bad happens, something really bad is going to happen. So there are also pressures on the DAs um, when they're looking at these cases. So they may not believe a recantation. They may just kind of listen to what the person says and still want to proceed on the case. Um, there are a lot of built-in problems with this type of case, I think, in particular. Um, going forward. And, and I think there are red flags on all sides for both the state and the defense on these particular cases. Sorry, Matt. Oh, no, no. Um, I think that's, that's great to mention. Um, and, you know, part of it is that I think there is sort of a um, numbness, I guess, that comes with these, these prosecutors, even though they're brand new, they're probably seeing affidavits of non-prosecution every single week. Um, you know, or every day, depending on how often their dockets are. So, I mean, they may be very used to the idea of uh, an AMP at this point, and they, I mean, it, it's just kind of like, just slides right off. It does not mean anything. Um, so, I mean, it's it's tough. We can't tell them every single affidavit of non-prosecution is credible, or every single recantation is credible. Um, but we're hopeful that they will look at cases with a critical eye and that they will think about, okay, um, I can, I could prove this if I proceeded forward to trial, I could not prove this. Um, and certainly we would hope that they reach out and actually speak with the complaining witnesses on these cases and that they, they make that contact because, um, you know, a separate discussion from all of this, one of the things that we've been talking about lately with best practices is just making sure that we provide a continuum of care to victims and making sure that we continuously um, let victims know what's happening with cases every step of the way. And part of that continuum of care is that very basic phone call up front just to let them know this is what's going on with the case. Um, you know, I can imagine in this case, if somebody, if one of the prosecutors would have reached out to uh, reach out to Manny sooner, maybe he would not have been there the day of the plea giving um, giving his written statement to the investigator. Maybe it could have happened differently, um, but our prosecutors just did not do that. Um, but all of that said, to, to, to Rose's point, there are a lot of different, um, a lot, a lot of different uh, conflicting issues here or a lot of different considerations. 
Um, we just hope that our people would be a little bit more mindful to avoid this type of thing in the future. And I should probably also mention at this point, we have a number of incredible prosecutors. All of our um, people in domestic violence are doing a great job. Just stuff like this can happen. And we just want people to be mindful of the fact that stuff like this can happen and that, that um, you know, there is no reason why Mr. Temeyev should have had a conviction for this uh, to begin with. Um, so the, the other thing to mention, I guess, so that's kind of from our ADAs and from the front end and, you know, error correction. From our side, um, this case made us think about best practices for post-conviction units and what written policies would need to look like when it comes to situations like this. And what do you do when you discover that sort of information partway through your investigation? So we, um, as a reaction to Mr. Temayev's case and to some of our exonerations out of last year, we went ahead and uh, started to draft more robust policies when it came to certain things. I mean, we've, we've now um, try to put written policies together for a number of different claims and ideas, but um, the policies are kind of a, they serve a two, twofold purpose for us. One, um, it's supposed to be sort of a instruction manual for post-conviction inside of our office, but two, these are things that we can publish and we can put out to um, different defense organizations and we can put out to the community here in San Antonio or Bear County, and we can let them know this is how we will handle these type of cases um, this is the type of care we're going to take when it comes to discovery and when it comes to victims and, and immigration issues and equitable relief. Um, all the things that we were hopefully thinking about at the time that Mr. Timayev's case came in, we've just put those in writing and given them a little bit more, um, a little bit more detail. And hopefully um, we can encourage people that are in a similar situation to Manny and Mishka to come forward and have conversations with us and, and to you know, make sure that we get to the right result in those cases. Um, you know, all of that, all of this kind of should be said with the um, caveat of, you know, everybody's situation is different, every state's different. Uh, we were very fortunate that um, we could do this here in Texas with the post-conviction law that we have. I know other states may not be as, um, may not have the same situation. And Texas post-conviction law is still very restrictive uh, when it comes to, to many issues. So we were fortunate that, you um, this was an 11072 case. We could handle it at the trial court. Um, we've had other cases that are, you know, have had similar situations under 1107. And the Palmer case that I mentioned earlier is one of them. And that had to go to the Court of Criminal Appeals. Um, every situation is a little bit different, but we were fortunate we were able to handle this one here. Um, there's not a one size fits all model when it comes to post conviction, but hopefully some of this and some of this talk about um, best, best practices and written policies, some, hopefully some of that can be helpful. Um, you know, I, I think that um, internally, outside of what's in the written policy now, a big part of this was, okay, so how do you pivot? Like, how do you keep moving through an investigation when you, when you move from um, this is going to be one type of case to this is another type of case? Uh, and so part of that on the post-conviction side has also been how do you um, stay in touch with the uh, opposing counsel? How do you keep them looped in? How do you maintain that trust and that uh, uh, excuse me, cooperation all the way through the process? And so um, working with Rose kind of provided us a really good model for that. Um, it was a really great experience. And so now we've got uh, actual written policies when it comes to communication that basically say, we're going to try to treat every case kind of similar to the case that we had with Rose. We want it to be a very robust form of communication. There's going to be connections every step of the way to let them know, here's exactly what we're doing, here's exactly what we need, here's exactly how we can move forward, non-adversarially to get to the right result. Anyway, that's my like, I, I know I just spieled for a while there, but I appreciate you all listening. This was a big case for us because we learned a lot from it. So anyways, I, I, I appreciate everybody taking a moment. Do we, are there any questions about, about the case or anything about the way we run things? Yes, yeah, so if you have questions at this point and, and you feel comfortable of kind of unmuting yourself and talking, go right ahead or put it in the chat. We'll be happy to address it either way. So there's a question so in Adele, the chat. You have your hand up? I do have my hand up. Uh, hi, Matt. Hi, Rose. Hi, everybody else on the call. I have to say that the degree and level 
of attention that you brought to this case um, and sympathy for both the complainant and the defendant, I think are actually really remarkable. Um, and I think the fact that you went back and started talking, especially to the line prosecutors in DV court is really remarkable because of course, what we would like is to see this level of attention and sympathy brought to all the cases in the first place. And I know that the pressure in DV court when there are so many more cases every single day um, is very different. But of course, what we'd like to see is all the cases being treated this way in the first place, right? Because this is you know, something that didn't have to happen at all if it hadn't been, you know, just sort of a routinized part of, you know, the cookie cutter process of criminal court, right? So it's very interesting and inspiring actually to hear about the lessons learned and how you're taking that back to everyday practice because that's something we hope everybody will do. That's, it was great to hear it. Well, thank you very much. Um, this, this sort of, um, you know, every single exoneration that we have, we try to break down how did this happen and how can we prevent it happening in the future? Um, I know that Marissa calls it root cause analysis. And I really like that idea of, you know, how do we get to the root cause of this sort of uh, error? And so um, it's something that we, we've tried to be mindful of. And we've had uh, several exonerations out of Bear County recently, um, each one a little bit different. And, uh, you know, it makes us think about, okay, how can we, you know, should this type of evidence be suspect? Should we not be considering this sort of, you know, um, this sort of evidence? You know, should we be looking more critically at this or that? So um, every, uh, every case is a little bit different, but we hope that our prosecutors will be able to find something to take away from that and do, do things a little bit different in the future, maybe just be a little bit more mindful, like I said earlier. Um, I've got a couple of questions that were sent to me directly here. And so I'm going to, um, Marissa, do you mind if I bring those up and then we can kind of all talk about Go right it? Ahead. Um, so there was a question sent to me about the defense role in the plea. And um, just from our side of things, once we shifted over to this was going to be an actual innocence case, we could not prove this beyond a reasonable doubt. We were um, not really considering an effective assistance anymore, but um, it did seem clear that there had been an improper, you know, there, there was not a, enough advice given as to the immigration consequences of the plea. Um, like I said earlier, there's clearly a sort of gap there. And um, whether Mr. Temayev understood that the deferred adjudication would be considered a conviction for immigration purposes, I, I'm not sure. I don't know if that was adequately explained to him. Um, fortunately, we didn't have to go through that, um, that analysis of, of dealing with um, the defense attorney or dealing with plea counsel because we had moved on to the um, actual innocence side of things. But I do think that there is something to be said. If we had been looking at it purely from an immigration relief standpoint, we would have been talking about um, we would have been talking about those issues and whether or not that admonishment was appropriate. Um, Rose, I know you, had, when we spoke last week, I think you had mentioned um, immigration issues when it came to pleas. And so I'll, I'll let you kind of jump in here. And I think everybody knows that that's one of the, the things that needs to be explained better, right? Defense attorneys need to take more time and explain immigration issues to the clients. Um, in Bear County, since this plea has been taken, the paperwork all contains information now about immigration ramifications. Some judges are better than others at going over that as well, just to make sure that it's covered. In this case, it was clear from the transcript, it was not done properly. According to Mishka, the defense attorney at the time also didn't go over any of that with him and he had no idea what the ramifications were. That was clear from talking to both Manny and Mishka that had he known it would affect any attempts to naturalize in the US, he would have not taken that plea, um, but he did not get the proper admonishments as he should have. Um, and, and just to kind of add one more thing there, I mean, that's unfortunately a very common claim that, that people were not admonished properly, um, you know, Padilla violations generally. Um, 
we we have policies in place to deal with that, and we hope that um, you know we hope we can correct it on the back end. But we've um, told you know there's kind of the project follow, follow, following Padilla about you know creative plea bargaining and working with defense, and we've asked through uh, in-house CLEs that our prosecutors be a little bit um, more open to working with defense counsel when it comes to immigration circumstances, um, understanding that you know, there are going to be consequences to the plea. Obviously, there are going to be situations where um, there's really no other option there. I mean, it is what it is. But if there is the option to plea to one of two cases, one that will carry immigration consequences and one that will not, and that's something that's important in the case, then we hope that um, our prosecutors will take that into account and be willing to work with defense. Um, there's a, another question here, basically asking to explain, this is from Randy, um, to explain the difference in Texas when it comes to uh, felony writs and misdemeanor writs. Um, and I know I kind of alluded to this earlier. So um, in Texas, our, our writs of habeas are filed under uh, Article 11 of the Code of Criminal Procedure, chapter, chapter 11 of the Code of Criminal Procedure. 1107 deals with felony writs and uh, 1107 deals with probation, um, community supervision, deferred adjudication, um, but also misdemeanor. Um, and so in this case, this was an 11072. Um, we had right before this, that 1107. So we had the um, ex parte John Palmer case right before this one. That was an 1107 um, because it was a felony. And because it's an 1107, it has to go up to the Court of Criminal Appeals for a final determination. Our trial court here would make a um, would make a recommendation on the case and you know what they believe that the result of the case should be, but the Court of Criminal Appeals gets to make that final determination. So on the John Palmer felony case, that went from our trial court recommending relief up to the Court of Criminal Appeals, so our highest criminal court granting relief and agreeing with the trial court's analysis, agreeing with our uh, basically our, our agreed findings saying that um, there was an absence of evidence in the case, the recantation and that absence of evidence should be enough. So from that case, from, from that felony case, a few months later, we, um, we moved over into Mishka's case, very similar situation where there's the absence of evidence and a recantation. And we thought, okay, this was sufficient for the highest criminal court in Texas um, so the, the argument is this should be sufficient for our trial court here in Bear County. Um, and fortunately it was. So um, because it was sufficient for the trial court here, we could actually, and because it was an 11072, we could get a final determination at that point in time. And like Rose said earlier, it was very quickly that we were able to, to move through that, that process and get a good result for Mishka. Um, and Rose, do you, do you, is there anything you'd like to add on that question? No. Okay, and I, I'm sorry, I know I'm just like scrolling through messages here. Okay. Um, so there's a, Lisa, there's a question from Lisa in the, in the chat about resources. Um, Lisa, I'm gonna ask you to unmute to ask it yourself for that. Hi, can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. Um, the question I had was, you said, and I agree completely on the cooperation from the defense side, but how do you handle that? Have you kind of put that in policy? How do you handle that kind of res intensive resource for each case? So you would have one attorney for each review? Um, have you thought about that? So I'm not, I'm not sure if I quite understand the, the question. So do you mean from the CIU side of things, one, one attorney for each review? Is that, is that yes. what you're asking? Yeah. Um, so I don't know if, um, I, I don't know if this is a good answer to that question. Um, so for, for a long time here, I was doing the majority of our writs that would come in. Um, so I, I would be um, kind of, spread out throughout all of these different allegations. We would have some writs that could be handled summarily and then we had other writs that would be able, we'd be able to, um, you know, spend more time on. 
the ones that we would handle very quickly were the ones that are basically going to be procedurally denied. We would still do an internal investigation on them and still look at the claims, but we understood that uh, is this is this not answering your question? I'm not sure if I'm following exactly. Well, I guess my question would be if you uh, the cooperation from the defense side is integral in accomplishing any amount of review. So what I found is that if you don't have the same person talking to the same defense attorney on the same case, which is me right now, it's you, you can't take those steps as quickly as you were able to resolve this case. Right. So do you, did you implement some kind of policy which is what I'm trying to do for staffing to put some foundation in for being able to say, this is why we need this many people based on this many applications for review. Yes, and thank you for mentioning that because that's Sorry. actually, um, well, I actually just made a budget proposal a couple weeks ago. So, <laughs> and I, I was saying, this is kind of, it's, it's difficult. We have this many cases and we want to give this many, um, we want to have this kind of like personal, uh, you know, hands-on touch with each with each case. Um, and so, yes, I mean, it's it's tough. It's definitely a resource, um, you know, it, 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 it's a really a pull on resources having to do so much and have hands-on. And um, the thing that's tough about our, it's, it's a good tough about our written policies, um, it calls for that sort of hands-on interaction the entire way through. We are supposed to be hands-on with the habeas counsel, with defense counsel. We're all supposed to be hands-on with complaining witnesses. Um, and it's supposed to be at every step of the process to keep them looped in and keep them, um, to facilitate that trust and that cooperation. Um, I mean, we kind of see it as our obligation here. That's not a good answer though, because I mean, it, it does take a lot of time. It takes a lot of resources. Um, and I wish that we had more. So I've, I've asked for additional staff for um, this next budget cycle. So I'm going to knock on wood here and hope that we get it. But um, yes, I mean, it is, it's very uh, labor intensive, I guess is probably the best way to, to say it. Um, when you want to have each case with a personal approach like that. Um, so, I mean, I, I wish that we had a, um, you know, a magic solution to workflow or something like that. But I mean, the, the bottom line for us is, yeah, it's tough. And it's an obligation we've gladly accepted, <laughs> I guess is the best way to put it. So we still have a few minutes left. I do want to encourage people to, to uh, make use of the chat, but I did want to follow up on one thing that Matt and Rosie both mentioned, which was that the order the judge signed, what you designed the order with the immigration consequences in mind. Um, and that you know, struck me as just a very holistic approach to this and not you know, kind of with the single focus on reversing a conviction or getting a vacater. And I just wonder if you could just talk about, you know, why that was a thought process for you and, and how that kind of may have impacted the way you approach this at the end. Well, speaking for me, um, I don't do immigration. So I had to call friends I know who did immigration and I explained the situation. And I asked if there was something, if I needed to explain everything in the order or if I needed to explain as little as possible in the order. I wanted to make sure that whatever the order said was going to have the best result for Mishka when he applied for naturalization. Um, and so I had to get information from friends who practice immigration and they told me basically, um, cause my thought process was wrong. My gut told me that I needed to put in there a lot of information about how this was not, um, not his fault, you know, all, all the information that occurred and they said, no, less is more because you don't want somebody getting it on the immigration end and reading it a different way. So you need to put as little as possible um, in that in the order so that it doesn't affect his immigration. And so Matt and I kind of discussed what to put in the order. We sent it through, the judge asked for us to tweak it a little more to show, um, to be very clear that the state was on board with uh, the habeas and that the case was gonna get dismissed. And so really everybody had input in the order. Um, but that's where I came from when I initially was drafting the order and then Matt and I put our heads together and then he had his input as well. And I'll, I'll let Matt go on about his part. 
Well, and um, part, part of it for us, there's, there's some trial and error horror stories here when it comes to uh, immigration, because we, we've had previous cases that have fit our immigration policies as far as relief was concerned. And we would, um, you know, our, our initial reaction, I think, was similar to what Rose is describing, where it's like, put as much information and much, as much basis into the findings as possible and into the order as possible. Um, we found out pretty quick that ICE um, and really uh, that, that uh, Department of Homeland Security, whoever it might have been, uh, didn't, they didn't like that. And they were not really willing to, to listen to our explanation of what had happened on the case. Um, it really is a kind of less is more approach. Um, not, to, not to get too dramatic about it, but I've had um, immigration prosecutors call me and chew me out um, and basically tell me they didn't care what I did with my cases. Um, they were gonna go ahead and proceed forward as if they, there was still a conviction in place. Um, and so we did not wanna give uh, ammunition to, to that. Um, and we wanted to be very, very clear um, through our use of wording. Um, we, we looked at recent immigration decisions and um, picked wording that we felt would best benefit um, Mishka's situation and, and help him through the next step, which was going to be, you know, going through that process and trying to explain that he does not have this conviction. Um, so that's, that's why the wording was so important to us. Um, unlike some of my other cases that I've handled, I've not received any sort of negative feedback <laughs> from the federal government about um, Mishka's case. So I'm assuming no news is good news there. Um, but I mean, I've had, I've had some federal prosecutors just call me to let me know that they're unhappy um, that we have done what we needed to do on these cases. Um, and, and that I'm there are some really great people working on those cases too. I don't want it to sound like I'm vilifying all of them. It's just one or two that have um, kind of given me a bad taste at times. So anyway, all of that said, that's why the language was so important. That's why we wanted to make sure that we worked with Rose every step of the way to do what was going to help her or to give her client, you know, exactly what he needed um, moving forward here. And I, I hope that we did that efficiently or effectively enough. Um, the other thing to mention here really quick, um, another outgrowth of Mishka's case, we, um, and Rose, you actually mentioned this to me a few weeks ago, and this is a recent change. So Rose had mentioned that Mishka had had difficulty with the expunction process here, mm -hmm. or that there had been some, some issues with the expunction process. So very recently, um, a couple of weeks ago, our unit, our CIU is now going to be assisting with expunctions for these sort of situations. When, um, when an individual is found to be actually innocent and their case is overturned and we've signed a dismissal or, or there's been an order to that effect, um, we will now be assisting with the expunction process to make it clear to um, DPS here in Texas that um, basically there is no longer a, a conviction, there's no longer orders related to that and that it should be expunged um, from their record. So it's our hope that that kind of streamlines the process and helps out people that are in Mishka's situation. Um, time will tell how effective we can be at that, but um, that it was actually kind of born out of, Rose, born out of your comment to me that, that Mishka had struggled with this. I thought, okay, what more could we be doing? So here we are, we're gonna give that a try and hopefully we can, we can do some good there. That's great. Um, so we are up on time here. Uh, and again, just thank you so much, both Matt and Rose, for, for your time with us today. I think this was a very important discussion. Um, and I'm going to use this to kind of pivot to the project that we're working on here with at the Quattrone Center with a lot of your help, which is trying to develop these guidelines and best practices Matt was talking about for engaging and collaborating um, between defense counsel and prosecutors in the post-conviction process. So I'm Um, you're you're on mute, Marissa. Oh, there we go. I just did a whole monologue without you guys knowing it. How about that? So um, just wanted to say thank you so much to Matt and Rose for your time. Uh, this was an incredibly important case, I think, in terms to learn about the process and, and how why collaboration is such an important part of it. And just in keeping with that, to remind folks of the project that we're working on with 
many of the criminal justice national leaders, NACDL, the Innocence Network, um, APA, Fair and Just Prosecution, as well as the Institute for Innovation Prosecution, on trying to, to help develop these guidelines and best practices that Matt's talking about on engaging and collaborating, collaborating in this post-conviction litigation investigation world. If you have not yet signed up for it or haven't heard about it, there's a link in the chat now. Um, please go there to learn more. Um, and just again, a reminder of next month, we'll have started a two-part process on cases that involve live suspect investigations while also investigation engage and investigating a case of innocence. So everybody can you know throw up in, in your your reactions and give huzzas or hand claps for Matt and Rose for being with us. And thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, very grateful to have you all. Thank you all very much. All the good rest you. of the day. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Rose. Thanks, Marissa.